Hello, I'm Brian Zahn, pastor of Word of Life Church in St. Joseph, Missouri. And I want to share with you something that I have found called the Gospel in Chairs. I didn't uh, design this. I didn't come up with this. It was originally developed by Anthony Carbo. And he is the priest at the Orthodox Church in Colorado Springs. And then I heard about it through Steve Robinson, who hosts Our Life in Christ podcast. But what the Gospel in Chairs is, is a presentation of the Gospel in two different versions. There is the modern, western, judicial version of the Gospel that most of us, especially in North America, are very familiar with. But then there is the more ancient, more biblical, the patristic, or it comes from the church fathers, understanding of salvation. We might call that the restorative view. So really what I'm going to do is contrast first the legal understanding of salvation with the restorative understanding of salvation. It's called the gospel in chairs. First, the legal understanding of salvation or the modern understanding, or I might even say misunderstanding. And it goes like this. In the beginning, God created man in His image, and to reflect His glory, and to have fellowship. But man in the garden sinned. And as man sins, he becomes sinful, and God, because He is so holy and righteous, cannot look upon sin, and so God turns away from man. But God, in His love for humanity, sends His Son to occupy our place. And Jesus Christ lives in our stead and He lives as we were intended to live. He lives in full relationship with the Father, never turning away, always doing His will. But at the end of His life, Jesus is put to death. And in that moment, the Father does the unthinkable. He takes our sin and places it upon Jesus so that Jesus becomes sinful. And God cannot look upon sin because of His holiness and righteousness and turns away from His Son. And Jesus Christ receives and experiences the full wrath of God. Now for we sinners, if we believe that God has done this and that Jesus has borne our sin and the wrath of God on our behalf, then we are protected from the wrath of God. We receive the righteousness of Christ as our clothing so that... As Martin Luther says, we are snow-covered dung. As many preachers have described it, Christ becomes our asbestos suit to protect us from the white, hot wrath of God against sinners. Now, that's if we believe this. If we don't believe that Jesus has done that, then we remain in our sin, and God's wrath remains upon us. We remain forever alienated from God, and eventually the sinner is condemned to hell. That's the legal understanding of the gospel, a modern version of it. The more ancient, the patristic, the understanding of salvation that would be common to the early church fathers, I'll call it the restorative understanding of salvation. I believe it's much more biblical. And it goes like this. In the beginning, God created man in His image, to reflect His glory and to have fellowship. But in the garden, man sinned and turned away from God. As a result, man became subject to futility and death. So that the great problem that the gospel addresses is not primarily the problem of legal guilt or personal guilt, although that's included, but the problem of Humanity being subject to death. That is the great problem the gospel addresses. Now because God loves humanity and doesn't want His creation to be subject to futility and death, God takes on humanity. He becomes a human that He might heal humanity. He takes on our nature that He might heal our nature. And so here is a woman who because of being subject to futility and death, 
has lived a life where she's gone from man to man, marriage to marriage. She's been married five times. Now she's living with a man, still never finding the love that she longs for. And what happens? God comes and sits down by her at a well. And he says, I am the water of life and I will love you. Here is a man who for the sake of greed and ambition has become a tax collector. That is, he's in collusion with the occupying Romans. And he participates in a system of oppressive taxation against his own people. As a result, he is ostracized and alienated daily. He has wealth and power, very few friends. No one wants to eat with him. No one wants to be his friend. But what happens? God comes and sees this tax collector up in the tree and he says, Zacchaeus, come down. I'll eat with you. I want to go to your house. And he says, salvation has come to this man's house. Here is a woman who has been caught in adultery. The religious establishment has condemned her and they want to stone her. But when she is brought into the presence of God and thrown down at His feet, God kneels down beside her and says, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. And then he speaks to the woman and says, I do not condemn you. Go and sin no more. Here is a man who has been so captured by the powers of darkness that he's inhabited by a legion of demons. He seems no longer hardly to be human. He's driven forth from his village. He lives in the cemetery. He no longer wears clothes. He cuts his body. He's become a madman. Everybody's afraid to go anywhere near that graveyard. But here comes God. And He sails across the Sea of Galilee. And He says, I will come to you and I will set you free. And He casts out the demons and the darkness so that the man is now clothed and in his right mind sitting with God. Here is a man who simply because of the random nature of, the humani of humanity subject to death has contracted some terrible disease that has caused him to be a paralytic. And when he is brought into the presence of God, what does God say? He says, son, your sins are forgiven you. And rise, take up your bed, and walk. And when humanity, driven by fear and pride, maintaining its system of an axis of power enforced by violence, take God and betray Him, spit upon Him, mock Him, scourge Him, condemn Him, and crucify Him. What does God say? I forgive you. And when humanity experiences the final dissolution and falls away into death to be forever separated from God, God says, love is greater than the grave and though you make your bed in Sheol I am there and God in Christ joins humanity in death in his wild pursuit of humanity God is willing to go all the way down into death but God also says I am the resurrection and the life and he conquers death I am he that liveth and was dead and behold I'm alive forevermore amen I have the keys of death in Hades. And he says, All who are in the grave shall hear the voice of the Son of Man, and they shall come out of their tombs. So now there is no place where God is not. He fills all things with His love. For God is love. And there flows from the heart of God's love a river of fire to those that respond to God's love with love. They return love for love. That love of God like a river of fire provides light and warmth. But to those who respond towards hatred, re respond with hatred towards God's love, they experience that river of fire as wrath. The Apostle Paul said it like this, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If your enemy is thirsty, give him drink. That is, continue to love him and treat him in love. But 
the, the Apostle Paul also says it will be like burning coals upon his head if he continues to hate and be your enemy. But all he has to do is turn around and say, instead of hating, I will love. And then when you give your former enemy, who is now a friend, food and drink, it's no longer torment to him, but it is the joy of a shared meal. This is the restorative, more biblical, more ancient, patristic understanding of the nature of salvation. The crucial difference is this. First of all, in this version of the gospel, you never pit God against Christ. Keep this in mind. Two foundational truths of Christian theology. Number one, God is immutable. He doesn't change. Number two, God is perfectly revealed in Christ. Christ did not come to change the Father or to placate the Father or to satisfy the Father. Christ came to reveal the Father. God is like Jesus. God has always been like Jesus. There has never been a time when God was like Jesus, but we haven't always known what God is like, but now we do. The Apostle Paul said it like this. God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself. He didn't say that God was in Christ reconciling Himself to the world. It is, it's not the Father that needed to be reconciled to the world. It's the world that needed to be reconciled to the Father. And that's why Jesus, perfectly revealing the heart of the Father, confronts the sin of humanity with simply this, I forgive you. The other difference is, you see that in the restorative, patristic, more ancient, more biblical understanding of salvation, God is never turning away from humanity. See, God is perfectly and fully revealed in Christ. When do you see Jesus ever turning away from a sinner and saying, I am too holy to look upon your sin? Did Jesus ever do anything like that? No. It was, in fact, the Pharisees that did that. The Pharisees were the ones that would say, I am too holy to look upon you and turn away. I want to suggest to you that God is like Jesus, not like a Pharisee. He's not turning away from us. As we turn away from God, the gospel is that no matter where we turn, God is always there confronting us with His love. This is not, the gospel is not this. That is not the gospel. This is the gospel. That when we turn away from God, He turns towards us. And when we turn away from God, He turns toward us. And when we run away from God, He confronts us with His love. And even when we murder God, He confronts us with forgiveness. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's a healthier, more biblical understanding of the gospel that doesn't pit God against Christ, but understands this, that God is like Jesus. God has always been like Jesus. There's never been a time when God was not like Jesus. We haven't always known this, but now we do.